All right, Mr. McAllant, it's been over a year since our last year, a little bit over a year, year and a couple of weeks, but it's crazy how much time flies. And I was re-listening to our podcast this morning and I was taking notes again. I was like, man, I forgot how potent this one was. And last time we we're talking a lot about health. Today, we're going to talk a lot about entrepreneurship and business productivity. But man, welcome back to the show, my friend. Yeah, it's great, man. It's great to be here. You're a great interviewer and, our great interviewer and I love what you do, so. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it, man. You know, we were just kind of chatting before we went live here about uh, you got the guitars in the background. If you're listening on Spotify, you can't quite see it. But if you're watching the YouTube video, you get to see some guitars. And you're saying, you know, you were in the, the music industry a little bit yourself. And, you know, kind of just love to dive into that, that tangent real quick before we dive into some of the other things. Yeah, something I've done since I'm 19 is I've only done businesses or jobs with things that I'm passionate about. So fell in love with guitar playing when I was 12. It was my, my first hardcore obsession, even prior to bodybuilding and eventually uh, formed a few bands and recorded an album. And then around 2002 built or co-founded guitar control with uh, Claude Johnson. And uh, yeah, we went on to sell probably about 50 or $60 million worth of instructional music courses so yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a great ride and I love music. I love creating music, writing music. It's, it's, it's awesome. You know, I think we'll talk about neurochemistry later, but nothing can activate neurochemistry like music. You know, it's very powerful. So to me, it's a, it's a brain optimizer as well. If you got the right song playing, you know, if you want to get more aggressive than, you want to crank the adrenaline with, with metal or rap, whatever works for you. And uh, if you want to get more to a flow state, then there's other types of music. So music is an optimizer. It's a neurochemistry optimizer and very powerful. Right? We can change our whole brain chemistry with the right song, dancing a little bit. So, yeah. So, I mean, I think music, it's funny. I was talking with a guy pretty recently and he asked me a question. He's like, what type of music you've been listening to? And I kind of gave an answer. He's like, what do you think that's telling you about, you know, where you're at in your life? And it was a very interesting concept of, you know, how, like you're saying that the music we listen to can really influence what we're doing. And intuitively, a lot of people kind of use rap or metal, like you're saying, when they're, when they're at the gym, trying to work out, trying to get that extra, extra hype. So I think it's interesting as we start to unfold this area of productivity we're diving into today the music you know you got the guitars in the background which wasn't a topic i was planning to dive into but it's it's all connected and that's you know the more that i learn about life and health and business in general is that how we do one thing is going to affect so many other areas of our lives and that's something that i feel like the more i peel back the layers of macalant i'm very uh interested and curious as to how you are able to do all these many things you do which is i think you know why we got to talk about productivity because you've done so many different areas of business and in the last um, episode we're talking about how you were selling your first thing online the early 2000s like the early ages of the internet which mm -hmm. and I, was, I was reflecting on that before we got on here it's crazy that the internet has only been around for like 20 years in full force where it is our life and it's not even like a part of our lives it's for many people it is their life so it's kind of crazy how all this stuff has come into fruition but you know, how have you been able to keep your hands in so many buckets and do them at such a high level of efficiency? Yeah, that topic is one of my favorite topics um, because I'm always obsessed with increasing what I call high impact output. So people call it productivity. I'm going to go right to the formula. We can break down the subcomponents. So the first thing is you, you must master effectiveness. And that's an ever evolving game. So effectiveness is doing the right thing, right? Cleaning my office is not the right thing. That's a very low value task. You know, working on the next product or the next big marketing campaign, very high value. That has a much higher level of effectiveness in terms of high impact output, right? So high impact output means there is output. Again, okay, we can do activity that has almost zero high impact right? It has almost no impact on any level. So that's always changing and evolving and it'll, it'll never stop changing and evolving. You know, if I was, if Bob Tomajers was a billion dollar company, everything I'm doing right now, I probably wouldn't or very, very little. And I'd probably be doing all kinds of new things. So we'll come back to that. 
But once, once you're doing the right things, the next step is to become efficient. And efficiency is as much about eliminating waste. And again, we can get into those subcategories, but eliminating waste will always make you more effective and then, or more efficient. And then increasing, again, this just the optimization of doing the right things in a better way. So efficiency is about doing things, um, again, the right way. Effectiveness is about doing the right thing. The third piece, and this is one that I think very few people talk about. And if you talk about multiplying output, to me, this is the biggest, once you've got effectiveness, you got efficiency. This is the biggest one, which is intensity. And that's something I learned a long time ago in my mid twenties um, from one of my mentors. He said, listen, you can't multiply your time, but you can multiply your intensity, okay? And then the fourth and last piece is overall time. And if you look at the research on that, so let's say you're, you wanna to go to beast mode, you wanna build an empire, how much time should you actually work? So there's data on that. And so 55 hours a week of actual work time, when you start getting past that, your performance starts declining. Now that's an average, some people, I'll just look at Elon Musk for an example. If we if we looked at Elon Musk on those four categories, he's superhuman on all of them, right? He's doing the right things. I've, you know, again, I've never worked with him or seen him work, but he has ten minute meetings. He's he's th these meetings are hyper optimized, so they're very efficient. He's he's a very intense human being, and he's working like 80, 90, 100 hours a week. Now I'm not that guy. I'm more of a like 50 hours, 40 hours a week guy. I'm, I'm always obsessed with the first three, again, effectiveness, efficiency, and intensity more than I am on working more. And, and you know, I, I was a workaholic in my 20s. I burnt out. And you know, when I start working past 60, 70, 80 hours a week, I, I just don't feel as happy and uh, fulfilled as a human being. Cause you know, then you really have to start sacrificing relationships and all these other elements. So that's where I'm at. Um, that's the formula in a nutshell. We can dive into any one of those. Yeah, big thing you mentioned on there is like efficiency. You're saying cleaning the office is not a very effective use of your time. I think that's a big thing that I'm learning is that I can, as an entrepreneur, I can stay busy all day. But just because I'm busy doesn't mean that I'm really spending that time well. And that's been a really big realization of the past, say, four to six months is really analyzing my daily tasks. What am I actually doing every day? Because sometimes it feels like the day's gone by. And yeah, I accomplished a few things, but not as much as I had intended to or hoped to or planned to. And then when I really started to dissect it, it was like, well, I was kind of doing this and I was multitasking, which I think we can, uh, many of us can agree upon is not a, not the best way to spend our time because we're just half-assing a lot of things. So I found if I batch things together, like say, I'm going to spend today is creating content, tomorrow's editing content, kind of stacking things better. That has improved my productivity tenfold in the past few months. So I think it's, it's an ever evolving process, but for me, it's eliminating a lot of those, those busy work tasks. So are you somebody that uses outsourcing? What do you do like to, to get rid of these little tasks that maybe they need to get done at the end of the day, they have to get done, but aren't the most important? How do you handle those? Yeah, great question. First of all, you want to be obsessed with buying time. Hmm. That's, that's, that should always be your goal. So as you make money, as your business makes money, you start hiring people and you're buying time. So let's let's do the evolution from like a one person business to a hundred, which is almost the number of employees that I have right now. So first you're a one man show or a one woman show and you're doing everything, right? So the first thing you want to do as soon as you can afford to is start getting stuff off your plate. What do you want to get off your plate? The fastest is low value task or things that drain you. So for example, customer support, it used to kill me, you know, again, I started building business in 2002. I always hated customer support. It drained me. Um, so, you know, just getting someone to take care of that 
it immediately dec decreased my stress, increased my happiness, and then I could shift more of my time to high impact activities, right? But that never stops. So, you know, again, bookkeeping, you can break down a business into two buckets. One is activities that generate income and then activities that support that. So customer support, usually web devs, usually, again, all, all the operational things are in the support bucket. As an entrepreneur, as a business leader, you want to get out of that as much as humanly possible, as fast as possible. And you want to shift your time and all your focus to, again, generating income. So I'll, I'll walk you through my evolution. And again, it's, it's always changing. But in the beginning, what I realized was the number one skill that I could learn was copywriting. So I realized that probably in like 2000, I remember it was a eureka moment. I was reading all these marketing books and copywriting books and just business books. And I had that light bulb in my brain go off and said, if you master marketing, you'll be able to start and build businesses at will. And that's been true. I've built 14 profitable companies since I'm 19. And the number one skill set that has allowed me to do that has been marketing. Now, marketing, you, we could you can talk about that all day. But one of the key sub skills of that is copywriting. So I spent three years. And what, is, uh, hiring, what, is, what is copywriting for anybody that's not familiar? Yeah, it's the art and science of writing words that persuade people to take action. That's what it is. So there's a science part of it, the formulas, the structures, the psychology, the evolutionary biology, all those are parts of it. And then there is a, a very strong key creative side where you want to be creating new things that resonates with your market. So that was a key skill. And then it evolved into learning advertising and marketing and then product creation. So I've built about 130 products, um, again, in, in this journey. So learning, those were the three core skills. It was copywriting, advertising, and product building. And with those three skills, I could build a product. I knew how to write the, the copy, build a website that would get sales and then get traffic to it. So I mastered those three things. And... You know, I would basically go on AdWords, spend money, uh, usually double my ad spend right away and, and scale those, those businesses. So, you know, it's evolved from there, but I'm just highlighting that those three skills are examples of high impact activities. And those were the three things. And I knew even back then that I don't want to do anything else. Don't, don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to get sucked into operations. Let's hire people that do that, that are much better than me at that. Let me focus on my zone of genius. And now those activities have evolved and you know, it's completely different now. Now I have people in my teams or, or team leaders doing all of those things or most of them. And uh, I've, I've evolved in doing other things. So you have to figure out for your business or your career, what those high impact activities are. For example, let's just use a a real estate agent, what's the high impact activity? I would say it's generating leads and then the selling, right? Showing the house. That's it. Everything else is probably operational. And ideally, you're just, again, focusing on that. And the other question too, is even at generating leads, can you build a team that is better than you in that? And then all you do would be show houses all day long. Um, so anyways, we, we can get onto all these rabbit holes, but I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Cool, man. Yeah, I think that that's a, a place that myself and a lot of people in my audience are at. They're kind of at that one man show and, you know, trying to figure out how to, like you said, buy more time. Because at the end of the day, there's only so much that one individual can do. There's only so much that a human being can physically do in one day without burning themselves out, like you're saying. And everybody's threshold for that is a little bit different. And I remember reading uh, the four hour work week recently, a um, few maybe a month or two ago. Um, and he's talking about just like you're saying, is like find people that can do the things you don't want to do or can do them better. And a mm -hmm. lot of that takes humility because, you know, a, a lot of times in the beginning, I didn't want to outsource. Like, oh, you know, I can do it better. But part of that is, hey, you got to let go of some of that control because you're going to stay where you're at if you don't. 
So recently, you know, I hired an intern to start doing some of those things that are, you know, I don't enjoy doing, like you're saying, like, for me, I love recording podcasts, I love having these conversations. But going back and doing some of the editing and some of the behind it's just time consuming. Like I said, it's not the most efficient use of my time. So outsourcing some of those things, so I can have more conversations instead of spending more time, you know, on the computer, making sure the audio is correct, and all those type of things. So I think outsourcing is, is honestly my main focus for the year 2022 coming up is, you know, getting myself to a place financially the rest of this year that 2022, I can then start giving off some responsibilities and buying more time. So like you said, I can hone in on the part of my craft that I'm the most effective on. And, you know, I think that that's a big thing you're saying, building a team. Mm-hmm. And because, you know, you look at the greatest empires in the world. It's not, it's not one person. It's a group of people working it together. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, ultimately it's, there is a team leader and their responsibility is vision and strategy and then execution though. It all comes down to the teams. You know, the buying time also extends to your personal life. That that part is critical. For an example, like how much time does the average spend buying food, prepping food, cooking the food, eating the food, and cleaning up? It's a lot of time. It's about 10, 12 hours a week if you do the math. So again, I'm not saying people should hire a meal prep company, but that's an option. You know, even driving around, like I I'm at the point where I'm happy if I never drive a car again. I was just in the States. I love pushing a button that Uber shows up. I can be productive in the back so I can answer emails or just bounce things around. So I'm buying time by being in the back of an Uber, right? Mm. You know, here I I live in Panama. You know, I have a a maid, uh, someone who prepares my food. Like I don't, I don't do anything except either high impact output or completely chilling out, mm. you know, and, and that's a good goal for people. I know that not everybody can afford that right now, but as, as much as you can, again, just be obsessed with buying time because either it's improving your business or it's improving the quality of your, of your life when you do that. Yeah, man, it's, it's really interesting how many different avenues we can break down. Cause like you said, personal life, we want to be able to be fully present with our family, with our friends, when we're able to be with them. And, you know, a big challenge that I've had over, you know, just past three years of being in, you know, the whole health connections business is there would be a lot of times I'd say no to events with friends and family. Cause like, Oh, I got to build my business. I'm not at a place yet where I can afford to take time off, which at the end of the day, then I just was working at the 60% speaks. I didn't give myself that time to really relax because I was doing everything. And that's a big thing. I took a day off on Tuesday for the first time in a while during the middle of the week, completely disconnected, went for a walk in the woods and just, you know, let my nervous system reset. Cause I think that's a big thing. I was going to go to the gym a lot. You know, I put on 18 pounds this past year. So I've been really nice. focusing on, you know, building my body back up. So I got to be pretty darn scrawny after losing, uh, after having an injury, got pretty scrawny. I was like, you know, I got to commit to that, but didn't really take the rest I needed. And then I was getting used the word last time in the podcast. I was getting frazzled and my nervous system was frazzled. And I recognized that and took the day off and feel like a completely different person. And some of that is just allowing ourselves to fully relax. And I love, like you're saying, is like either be fully in or fully out. None of this in-between stuff. And that's what I'm really learning is that the in-between is, it's kind of like that purgatory. It's kind of, you know, yeah. kind of like on the brink of death there because you're not really productive, but you're not relaxing either. So you know that, yeah, I called it the gray zone. So yeah, you described it perfectly. And one of the best books ever written, this, this book changed my life and kind of created the structure that I needed. And you hit on it is the powerful engagement. Mm-hmm. And the Who's principle that, of that book, uh, Tony Schwartz, and I forget the co-author, but cool. what they did, they were studying high performance. They were studying some of the best tennis players in the world. And what they noticed was that the best players in the world would play with their rackets in between plays. Mm. But what were they doing really? They were giving their break, their brain, sorry, their brain a little break. And by doing that, they would recover just a little bit more than the opponent did. And it, it leaded to a significant edge. So to me, entrepreneurs, the best analogy is we want to be operating like athletes. 
So, you know, I've, I've trained professional athletes, NHL guys, triathletes, professional fighters. And there, there's a very, let's start with the big picture, right? So the mesos, the mesocycles usually are the pre-camp or the camp, right? So you're getting ready for the season, which is very different than the training for the season. So usually you work more on building up the weak attributes. And then during the season, you're trying to optimize play. And then after the season's done, then it's a, usually a recovery cycle. And if you look at almost every professional sport from UFC to hockey to whatever, that's what they do, right? So there's a, there's a significant recovery period after the competition. Because the competition, like, you're pushing everything to the max, right? Let's say you're in the playoffs. I mean, you're pushing your nervous system, your neurology, your physiology to the absolute limit. And after that, you need a break. So if we, zoom, if we use that analogy with entrepreneurs, um, the way to structure that, again, just depends on person to person, but the way I structure it is, yeah, usually like once or twice a year, there's a hyper intense period. Like I'm in that right now. So from now until probably mid-December, I'm going to crank the hardest I have probably all year. We're working on a book that's going to get published next year, nutrition book. So that plus everything else. And then I'm going to recover during the holidays. Right? I'm going to go see my parents, which I haven't seen in a couple of years because of COVID. So I'm, I'm planning that from a mesocycle. And then from a macro cycle, um, then you're looking at your kind of week to week as an entrepreneur. So for me, I have I rarely work on weekends. Uh, if I have to, I will, but it's pretty rare. So taking Saturday, Sunday off is the time off to, to reboot and, and recover. And then on the micro recovery, it's taking time throughout the day to go walk with the dog, go in the park, do some yoga stretches, do a few push-ups, go in the sun, tan, play, play songs, play guitar, go on the couch, meditate, take a nap. Like all of those things will help you reboot. And, you know, the difference I feel when I do that versus when I don't, it, it's, it's significant. Like I can maintain four or five hours of hyper-focus because we, we know how to hack neurochemistry. And when you do neurofeedback, you can really extend your focus, but I still feel better and perform better if at least every two hours or two and a half hours, I take a 10, 15 minute micro break and come back. So it's the same thing at the gym, right? You can't squat nonstop for 60 minutes. Right. It does, you know, even Tom Platts, he, he tapped out after 10. So the point is we need these little micro breaks. We need these macro breaks and we need these meso breaks. We need all of them as entrepreneurs. So mastering that for you, um, is the, is the game in my opinion. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny you say that because I also this realization pretty recently that I've been very good over the past few years of the micro breaks, but it's the, the, the macro and the meso breaks that I don't often give myself the time. So re, as of like the past six months, since this whole kind of aha moments have been unfolding, I've been working less on weekends every Sunday, at least off Saturdays is now, you know, kind of clean up a few things if I have to and, you know, close out some things from the week, but starting to get to that point where weekends are now just going to be for relaxation because I'm recognizing it's not sustainable if I just keep going at the pace I have been going the past few years. And, you know, like I said, uh, my nervous system is definitely feeling a little burnt out. So, um, you know, because sometimes I, I deluded myself to think that these micro breaks would be enough to kind of keep on going. But at the end of the day, you know, like you're saying, you can't squat all day. So even if I'm taking a, a rest in between sets, I can't just keep doing the same things over and over again. So I like that analogy a lot. Yeah, I feel like the big breaks, and I, I think 10 days is optimal. Hmm. So something I've, I've talked to a lot of people about, Tim Ferriss also talks about it for our work week. Like I just did, I went to Nicaragua. So you want to go, here, here's some rules that I have. One, I need to leave my normal environment. Hmm. If I'm just in my house, you know, again, what fires together, wires together is the axiom of the mind. You know, there's too much here that I connect with and it's easy to get, you know, I, I can't rest and recover like I can going certain places. So leaving is one. Two, you need to be in nature. There's some incredible research 
And this is something that I suck at, but in a perfect world, I would take three days off a month and go somewhere where I'm not saying you'd be completely disconnected, but I'm primarily in nature, either the forest, the mountains, the beach. Um, because if you look at the recovery and the research, it completely reboots your brain. There's some really fascinating research on that. So I don't do that that often. I usually, again, usually it's three months and then I go take 10 days off. But the 10 days is critical because, again, when I went to Nicaragua and San Juan del Sur two weeks ago, which is one of those places for me that I just, I just recharge, reboot, rejuvenate, it took me three, probably really four days for my brain to, to go from a hyper intense beta zone down to alpha theta, right? Just relax. Literally, like you feel your brain kind of slow down and you go from okay, what you, I, I, there's nothing I can do. I feel bored. What the hell's going on to, okay, I'm chill. I'm relaxed. I'm enjoying the beach. It's beautiful. I don't need to do anything. And I'm just present. And that's where the recovery happens, right? The first three, four days, I'm still in like work mode. My brain's still revving, right? But by day four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, that's where I'm really rejuvenating. So that's why I'm a big fan of 10 days, which is basically like two weekends, right? You leave Friday, come back the not the first Sunday, but the second Sunday. And if you do that, I mean, for me, if I do that three times a year, um, I'm highly optimized compared to if I don't. So, yeah, no, it's funny you say that because there's so many times where I give myself a weekend and like you said, my brain's still in high gear and, and I have a hard time turning that off. So I'm going to definitely take that recommendation. I've been looking to make a trip down to get some people down to Virginia, um, which is only, you know, 10 to 12 hour drive. So, um, nice. and I was thinking about doing it for about 10 days. So then maybe that's, that's the move is just go down there and just relax, rejuvenate, you know, go see some nice mountains and hikes and farms and all that. And, you know, just kind of hit the reset button. Cause I think we all, we all need that from time to time. So I love that perspective. Um, but I want to kind of shift gears a little bit to, you know, we're talking about marketing a little bit, and that's a big thing that, you know, obviously online marketing is kind of everything right now in terms of business. And especially the past couple of years, it's been business is online. So nice. What do you recommend in terms of online business? Because obviously you've had a lot of success with that. You know, do you recommend organic marketing? Is it paid ads? Kind of, I know this is a loaded question, but kind of for somebody who is a one-man show at this stage, like what do you recommend the best place to start is? Yeah, great question. First of all, you, you want to be constantly studying and working on your marketing craft. So again, I, I touched upon it earlier. One of the most important sub-skills is copywriting because everything you say, whether it's in a video or even talking to a client or on a, on a podcast, what you're saying, what I'm saying, it's copy, right? It's words. So mastering the ability to communicate effectively and powerfully to persuade people, it's a key skill. And there's a lot of nuances there. Again, on a podcast, I shift, I, it's a very different mode than if I'm doing a 60 second pitch on a Facebook video. So there's a lot to learn there. It's an endless game, but, but that's the first key component. As far as online, the second thing you want to get to a certain level of understanding and then probably find someone who's really good at it is design. Aesthetics, website design is huge. So one of the things that I've only met one guy that has done as many tests as I have um, is split testing. So I've done about 19,000 AB tests. And that's another key component because most people build their business on theories and opinions. I don't care. I want to get out of the realm of theories and opinions. And I want to do the most effective thing based on reality, based on what my customers actually tell me that they like or don't like. And that's what's awesome about a split test. You basically use software and I could take like two completely pictures of you, Rob, right? One where, I don't know, you're at the beach flexing and the other one you're in your office. We could split test that. And I guarantee that one of those would obliterate the other one. 
And what happens is, let's say you increase your leads by 200% with that one image, which by the way, I've seen as much as 800% differences with, with the same person, just a better picture of them or a different picture. And by the way, it is very hard to predict what's going to work, what's not gonna work, unless you've done it um, a, a ton. But even that, I'm still wrong very frequently, probably 20, 30% of the time, things that I don't think are going to work, work, and things that I th thought were going to work, don't. So you have to be humble and the data and the insights keep you humble. So that's another key thing. And I've, I've taken businesses from unprofitable to multi, multi-million with this process, with this optimization process. It's one of my number one skills. It's the one thing I'll probably always do because I have not been able to find someone that's better at me than that. And it's such a high value thing because even with bioptimizers now, if I increase conversion rates 10% on bioptimizers.com, that's like $2 million a year. So $2 million with something that sometimes takes me 10 minutes to think of. And then of course the team executes. So I'm getting paid for my thoughts. I'm getting paid for the quality of my high impact output. And that's the beautiful thing with split testing. And you learn. I cannot, or, and by the way, this is also true for health and it's true for business. I'm obsessed with feedback loops. So a feedback loop is I do something and then I get feedback. An overring is a feedback loop machine. Neurofeedback, which I've done about seven weeks of, is a real-time neurofeedback system. A constant glucose monitor is a feedback loop. A split testing process or a split test creates a feedback loop. Every ad, every ad you run is a feedback loop. And most people, they don't recognize the value of those feedback loops. And the value is in looking at it and asking yourself, why is this working? Why is this not working? How can I make this better? How can I optimize this? And that's something that's like a hardwired into my brain. I'm obsessed with optimization. As that's why we call bioptimizers, bioptimizers, uh, biological optimization. It, it's hardwired into me. It's hardwired into my my business process. So that's one of those things where most people could probably not exaggerating to double to quadruple their business if they just started running split tests for six months. We're doing nothing different. No more traffic. No more nothing else. They could double or quadruple by just running split tests. Now, that same process. So the, my number one skill set from a traffic generation perspective is advertising. And it started with pay-per-click advertising. I was advertising on pay-per-click with Overture, which was a predecessor to Yahoo. And then AdWords from day one. So that's a much more difficult game you know, it's a very profitable game if you crack it. It used to be a lot easier. It's become a lot more difficult. Um, Facebook, I'd say, is a bit easier. So what I typically tell people when it comes to generating traffic is it's like medicine in the sense that you want to find the right traffic source based on your natural strengths. So you don't want to be doing things that you're naturally going to be struggling with. Like you're doing podcasts and you just told me earlier, you love it. It energizes you. You, you. you have fun. So that's an example of, okay, do more of that. Right. And of course, with the podcast, you can put that on YouTube. You can put it on Instagram, blah, blah, blah. So you want to be working with traffic sources that are strengths. I was always a gamer as a kid. So for me, like pay-per-click, was a very gamified environment and it could kind of apply that same approach or thinking to it some people are extremely analytical and they're very good with seo like the super nerds they tend to gravitate to search engine optimization it fits their skill sets some people are hyper charismatic and they shine on youtube Right, they, you just put a camera in front of them, and they're just going to draw the viewer in. They're very skilled at that. They used to be partners with Elliot Hull, who has about two million subscribers. Um, he's one of those guys, right? Uh, you know, friends with Brendan Carter. He's one of those guys. So some people have that magnetism that makes them really good, kind of one-on-one -on -one in a YouTube context, and they're able to build audiences. 
Some people are just really more entertainers and that's who's dominating TikTok. So TikTok is an entertainment platform. So you really, really have to figure out, okay, what do I resonate with and what can I get really good at because I like it and it fits my natural strengths and skills. And then you just, you, you hyper-focus on that. And it probably takes about 12 months of a hyper-focus to go from, you know, normal to really good or great. And that's when you start making money. I think a, a mistake people do is, okay, they start learning about internet marketing. Oh, there's pay-per-click, there's affiliate marketing, there's SEO, there's podcasts, there's all these things, right? There's probably about 15 to 20 different channels you can do. But if you, if you try to become good at all of them, you're, you're never going to master any of them. So my typical advice is pick one, the best one that you think you can really get good at and do that for a year. Once you get really good at it, then focus on another one and then another one. And then you start building teams to maintain those old ones or grow them. So for example, with Bioptimizers, we have four traffic teams and all, and some of them manage a few channels, but usually they manage two to three channels a piece and that's it. So, and then they have, you know, six to eight people managing three or four channels. And again, within those teams, they get highly focused. So that's been the process and that's how you kind of scale. So for a long time, I was stuck at like six to 8 million a year um, in terms of, of yearly revenue. And, you know, this, this year we'll do about 25. So the, the jump from like six to eight, which I was at for probably seven, eight years to 23 to 25 is what we're going to do. And then next year we'll probably do 45 to 50 was really mastering again, one thing at a time, but mastering team building. And then what I do today is more either launch new teams or help the current teams get better optimize them and then give them the right strategy, give them the vision, and then they execute. So yeah, that's it. Beautiful answer. Yeah. And then again, come back to what I was saying earlier, I, I tend to get caught up in the trying to do everything, trying to wear all these hats. So that's a great reminder um, for me, especially because, you know, I, I think that, like you said, we realistically can't do everything and actually hired a SEO team to start working on my website because I built it myself back in 2018 when I first started. And, um, you know, it's definitely outdated and definitely could use some work because I didn't know, I knew nothing about SEO then. And, you know, three years from, you know, three years ago, a lot has changed in the world of SEO in that time. So that's something else I outsourced and, you know, it's a little bit expensive, you know, but at the end of the day, I, I believe that the ROI will be well worth it. Um, and I, you know, I'm, a, I'm just starting month. This is like almost the end of month two with them. And they said, you know, usually four to six months where you'll start to see yeah. some real results. So um, you know, I have faith in that process. And, you know, for me, definitely a big shift is, you know, really not trying to do everything. I've cut out LinkedIn, I've cut out Facebook, and basically kind of committed to like YouTube and uh, Instagram is the main two I'm going to be moving forward with in terms of platforms. And, um, but obviously, Instagram and Facebook are connected. So just auto post to Facebook. But, um, you know, you mentioned with the split testing, that's going to be something I think can be really valuable. Um, that's something even kind of doing my own split testing on Instagram is using polls like, Hey, which one do you like better? And kind of ask yeah. my audience that feedback. And I think that, like you said, sometimes I'm like, really, you guys want that. And that's, that gets all, that was my least favorite, but it's not about me at the end of the day, it's about the customer and what they want and their needs and their goals. So I think that realistically, you know, asking for feedback and the split testing is incredibly valuable and you know definitely um you know reminded me i'm going to commit to youtube for for one full year and see see how that goes yeah you you hit upon what i think is the foundation of everything and maybe we should have started there which is your customer obsession that is our number one core value of optimizers i think any great company it has to be in the dna and if you look at marketing the fundamental thing about marketing is that you're creating things that resonate with very specific avatars. And again, avatars is just a, an industry term for the people that you're going after. Now you might have multiple avatars. Usually, usually your every company has maybe three to seven, sometimes a bit more, sometimes less, but 
you, you want to understand that person better than they understand themselves. When you get to that level, there is no bigger edge than that. Everything else becomes easy and you start building things either on the product side or on the marketing side that just resonates, right? And if you look at every, every successful product has achieved that. It's impossible to do that. And I call that the value nexus. The value nexus is in, in that Venn diagram, that intersection of what your market wants, you build that into your product, and then you build that into your marketing. So that, that's the magic zone. And that's not easy. You know, what I just said is not easy to do. Sometimes it takes weeks and months to figure that out. Sometimes it's years. Sometimes companies build products that misses the mark on that. And by the way, that's why I'm one of the best entrepreneurial books ever written is Lean Startup, which is also a feedback loop system. And I've lost millions of dollars by not doing that, by overbuilding a product that I wanted based on my desires and I missed the mark on actually what the market wanted and would be willing to pay for. And it cost me dearly. So, you know, I, I have not batted a hundred percent. And again, it's only when I've, I've, I've I went self-centered and we've tested that in copy as well. You know, I remember I used to work at world's gym, uh, downtown Vancouver <laughs> and the owner had a pump Pom Pomeranian, the dog, and the advertising was the Pomeranian and the chair for the gym. And I remember just laughing my ass off because I had been studying marketing. And, you know, that's an example of like self-centered marketing. And even with your copy, I'll give you a, a little copywriting tip. You want to get rid of virtually all me, my, and change everything to you, your, yours, right? That's a very simple tactic that it will increase conversions. So again, just when you when you're copy editing, um, again, get rid of virtual unless you're telling your your biography. Of course, you need to say that in your own um, in first person. But other than that, you always want to be using you, your, your, yours, and focus on the customer when you're talking to them. Give another example too for videos or for podcasts. Never say. Hey guys, you folks, etc. It's always you. Like you want you want to be talking to the listener on video or a podcast as if it's one on one. It has a way bigger impact, you know. Now some people will create names for their tribes and use that. I, I, that's a powerful tactic as well. But in general, I like to try to keep it as one on one as possible. Even, even if I'm talking to a million people using a video. Great tips. Yeah, I'm writing some more notes down here. So I love it. And, you know, you mentioned some things about products. And I think that's a big thing, you know, with digital products nowadays, between online courses, books, and all that type of stuff. What do you, what do you typically recommend or what have you done in terms of selling these digital products? Because um, I find for me personally, I have an easier time selling something that's physical, like they're going to get something in the mail, whether it's like a, you know, by optimizer supplement or something like that, but I have a harder time selling a digital product. Do you use funnels? Do you still use this AB testing? Kind of what's your strategy for selling a digital product? Yeah. So I, I think I've got a, a unique perspective on that question because we were selling, again, I started selling things in 2002, right? And I've sold in terms of info products, I've probably sold around over 60, maybe 70 million. But most of that was with guitar control. But what I've seen over time, and this is the key, the key part of the question. What I've seen over time is that there's a gravitational pull in the perception of the value of information. We can't fight that. YouTube, blogs, podcasts such as this, like information, the perceived value of information is going like this and it's not stopping and it will not stop. Now, 
is there information that certain small niches of people are willing to pay for? Yes, it needs to be rare, new, not readily available, and extremely valuable. So certain specialized pieces of knowledge, especially in the business world where, okay, I'll pay five grand for a course because I know I can make half a million using that in the next 12 months. You know, those, those kind of highly specialized skills um, might make sense, but even that I am not bullish on because there's always people that will go on YouTube and, and share the same information for free at some point. And that's what killed guitar control. So at guitar control today, our sales are down probably like 95% compared to the peak. Why? Because there's hundreds and hundreds of millions of free videos on YouTube about guitar playing. There's, there's almost no song on the planet you can't go on YouTube and learn and lessons and whatever. Now, despite saying that, of course, there are people that are selling information successfully. Look at masterclass.com. But again, the, the markets are always evolving. The perception of value is always changing. And what I call the value line is always moving. And let's use Blockbuster as an example or video content. So it was Blockbuster. You had to spend 15 minutes, burn $5 of gas, pay six bucks for a movie, drive back home, then go bring it back. So you lost an hour and you probably spent 15 to $25 in gas and rental fees to bring one movie back. And if you look at the, it's like, probably 100,000 X more value if we look at it using that formula is what Netflix did. And that's why they're the most valuable entertainment company in the world today, even more than Walt Disney. And why is that? Because I can get access to tens of thousands of shows and movies. I don't need to leave my house. I need to pay gas. It's, it's like I said, it's 100,000 X more valuable. And by the way, the rule of thumb to crush the value line is 10x. So if people are using something in order to get them to shift behaviors, your product, your offer needs to be about 10 times more valuable than what they're currently using. Why? Because now we're dealing with human nature. Humans don't want to change activity. They don't, they hate friction. They hate learning new things. Again, it's, it's hardwired in our biology. So for, for them to go through that pain it needs to be perceived as 10 times more valuable. So again, if the information is legends like in Masterclass or with platforms like Lydia.com, where it's like a Netflix for learning, then yeah, you can pull that off. But somebody coming out with a $97 or $50 course and in your industry, health and fitness, um, again, I've been in it for a long time. And, and I have a lot of friends that have been in it. And even some of the best marketers that I know in the fitness space that are jagged, they look great. They've got half a million followers on YouTube. Most of them have pivoted because it is one of the most, if not the most competitive arena um, in online marketing. So the question becomes, well, what can you sell? Right? I, I, probably the question you're asking yourself. And again, I, I'm my opinion is give the information away for free, like you're doing with your podcast, and you use that as lead gen. You use that as a bond builder, as a relationship builder. Now, as far as what to sell, here's two things that will never stop selling. One of them is, again, consumables, and that you know, includes supplements and you know, food and all of those things. And two is experiences. So experiences in our in your world, in our world, you know, coaching, boot camps, one-on-one, -on -one, all of those are experiential. So humans' desire for experiential things will never, it'll never change. Now, I do think eventually it'll evolve to VR experiences. So the, the form or the delivery is going to change. But even then, I mean, humans will always love going to a concert and experiencing music with people or going to a movie theater and you know, laughing with a crowd of people. There's, there's something magical 
Um, Kotler talked about it, called it ecstasis or ecstasis, where you're experiencing something with a group of people and there's, there's magic in that, right? So those are the things that will never fade in my opinion. So figuring out how to either build, again, world-class consumables or world-class experiences becomes the game. And a good coaching program, and again, it could be group coaching or, or that kind of things, or a physical experience where you go for a retreat for four days and five days in Costa Rica and do something really cool. Um, you know, those things are as popular as ever, you know, and, and I don't see those things fading. So, and this goes back to what we were just talking about five minutes ago. You must understand what the market wants and what they're willing to pay for. Are they willing to pay a hundred bucks for teaching them how to weight lift? No. You know, again, maybe some extremely hardcore power lifters or weight lifters that want very specialized information from the best in the world. They'll pay maybe for that, but the rest of them won't. So Again, I've seen the market move significantly, especially probably starting about seven, eight years ago. And it's, it's not stopping and it won't stop. Eventually, um, all information will most likely be free or close to free. We're pretty close to that, right? And that's why I'm not bullish at all on selling courses. Well, yeah, that's a great response. And definitely, you know, it makes a lot of sense because um, courses is something that I, you know, I've made a couple small courses over the past year or so and like i said it's, it's tough to sell them and that was part of my thought process too is like why couldn't someone just go on youtube and look this stuff up because they can they won't be getting my perspective so then it comes down to do they value my perspective enough to pay for it over the other people that can probably free on youtube which you know it's a whole nother whole nother rabbit hole to go down but you know i kind of want to just hear from your experience over the many years you've been in business as to What's been the biggest challenge, you know, personally, professionally, in terms of getting you from the beginning stages where I'm sure like everybody, there's a bit of a struggle um, to now being, you know, at a place where you've had a lot of success? Yeah, my struggle is actually in the middle. You know, I'm not going to lie. I, you know, my first real business was at 19, was with College Pro Painters, uh, did that for two years. It was a franchisee. I was successful. Um, I think we did like 40K the first, you know, that was in a summer, about four months and 55, I think the second year. And then I just started building personal training companies. So I built probably the first uh, personal training company in the city where I was from, which was Moncton, New Brunswick in Canada. I think I was the only trainer and I got up to, you know, I was maxed out. I was 80 hours a week in the gym, went to Vancouver, um, built another personal training company. I was probably the second busiest guy at, at world's gym, downtown Vancouver, which was kind of the, where all the top people went to, you know, the rock and Ben Affleck, all these people would, would train there. And again, that was, that's when I started really putting together the marketing game. Now, simultaneously, as I'm doing all of these things, and there was some other things I built along the way, per, you know, self-defense, and I was doing all this stuff, but I was studying online marketing, and, and my first real success was a skincare product. I had a client that built a, a massive private labeling company. They're still around today. They're huge. And she built me an anti-aging serum, and I was able to use my copywriting skills, my advertising skills, and put together an effective website, effective advertising campaigns, and hit five figures the first month, and scale that, launch guitar control, and like right around that time, launched the predecessor to Optimizers, which was kind of a natural bodybuilding business around that time, 2004. So I launched like four companies from 2002 to 2004. Now, here's where the struggle comes. And I'll, I'll share another dark moment prior to that. But the real struggle was with drug addiction and alcoholism. So, you know, I was born with the wiring, started drinking when I was 12. And you could call me kind of a functional drunk and drug addict from the age of 12 to 28. And functional meaning that primarily do it on the weekend when I would do it at the out of control that evening or two days. And then, you know, 
from Monday to Friday, you be functional or semi-functional. But that that degraded. At 28, I discovered <laughs> harder substances like MDMA, psilocybin, um, and I went off the rails. I divorced my wife. I left my wife. We, we weren't happy. So was it because just because of the drugs? I think no matter what, it would have happened. Got married too young to the wrong person. But left her and I, I just completely went off the rails. So from the age of 28 to 32 and change, 32 and a half. So it was like four and a half years of out of controlness. And like when I say out of control, like, you know, it, it was completely out of control. Now, the, the, the crazy thing is um, I was still able to, <laughs> to make a really good living from the businesses I'd built prior but I lost five years. Like, you know, I, I lost five years. I was not building anything. I was either destroying or barely maintaining. That was where it was at. So, you know, it's five years I'll never get back. Um, where would I be today if I had lost those five years? God only knows. Um, uh, I'll never know. And it's okay. I don't regret the past. It, it led me to the bottom, which I hit. And I've been sober now for 12 years. So it was all worth it to get to the place that I am. But, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, the majority have the wiring of an addict or an alcoholic. It's, it's part of, it's the flip side of the dopamine system that we're wired with that makes us entrepreneurs. It's a great book called Driven by Doug Brackman. And that book's probably the best book written on this topic. He was a former Navy SEAL. And essentially, that's our, that's our genetic wiring. And if we don't learn to manage the dark side of it, the character defect side, and get hyper-focused on healthy things, the right things, whether it's health, fitness, entrepreneurship, um, we can get lost in some dark places. And a lot of us do. And fortunately, only a small fraction make it out. And you know, um, by the grace of God, I'm, I'm one of them. So that was the darkest period by a long shot. I mean, I had a lot of fun during that time, but like I said, I was, I was self-destructing and, and destroyed a lot of things, including, including businesses, including friendships and, and relationships. But I'll, I'll go back to the darkest moment prior to that. And this was right before I kind of hit my first real home run, which was the skincare stuff. So I was studying again, advertising, marketing for like three years. I spent probably about $100,000 on courses, seminars, mentors. I was obsessed. Like I was going to every copywriting event I could. Uh, these weren't cheap events, like five grand to attend, another two, three grand to travel. Um, I hired, you know, mentors. Again, I subscribed to every newsletter, bought every course. So I'm about 100K deep. And I hire my mentor. I'm not going to name his name. He passed away. I'm, I'm going to respect, um, respect his, his heritage. He's extremely well respected in the copywriting space. So I hire him because he's my hero. He's my mentor. And he was 15K USD. It's a lot of money for me at the time. Again, I was living in Canada. It was like $22,000, $23,000. Hired him, flew to Miami spent three days with them. And I didn't know the time he was also, uh, ironically, he was uh, an active drug addict. He used to brag he would spend 30K a month on drugs. So he wasn't very functional. And uh, basically, I lost that money. So that was the first blow. Second blow is somebody broke into my apartment and stole a safe that had about 20 20 plus thousand in cash and a, and a camera that was worth 5k. Um, I was in New York when that happened. And my, my, my wife called me just crying and, and that was a blow, but, and then I got scammed with something else for about seven. So all in all, and again, keep in mind, like that was the majority of the money I had at the time, probably lost 50 K in like two months, three months, again, three different things, but the blow was gear was, was the copywriter. And that blow, I, I, I was decimated emotionally. It wasn't just the money, but it was the fall of an idol. It was kind of a double blow. 
And I call a friend of mine and Dan Gallup, who, uh, who's a very good marker in our space. I said, Dan, you know, here's what happened. And he says, listen, man, you've got the skills to make it work. And I said, you know what? You're right. Like there was a part of me that was scared to go out there. There was a part of me that was scared to kind of launch that first business. And I was in skill building mode and, you know, I've, I've crushed this, this defect, but the defect was perfectionism. And now it's, you know, if you study lean startup, you write, you read that book, perfectionism will kill you. And it's killed. Like, you know, I've repeated that mistake later with back with building software and things. And again, lean startup is minimum viable or minimum lovable, put it out in the world, get feedback and then improve it. And that's been such a game changer, but I basically spent three years in perfectionism. And then I was crushed when what I thought was my, my lottery ticket didn't pan out, which was my mentor. But it goes back to extreme ownership, which is our second core value of optimizers. When I left that call with Dan, that's basically what he gave me. He's like, listen, stop relying on people. Stop looking outside of yourself. Just you've got what it takes, put together a website, a good product, and just launch the damn thing, which is what I did probably like three or four months later. And, and that was the beginning and, and I've never looked back. So that was a dark time. That was a dark time. And again, it's, yeah, you want to look outside of yourself, get mentors, get coaches, but there's a moment in all of our lives where we have to realize like no one's going to save us. I have to save myself. I have to take extreme ownership for my life. I have to take extreme responsibility for everything that's happening and everything that's going to happen. And when people do that, that's usually a huge turning point. Thanks for sharing that, man. I really appreciate you diving into that. And, you know, I definitely recognize that part of myself. You're, like you're saying kind of the, the addictive personality, um, which is a reason why I've never done cocaine. Cause I believe that I would probably be heavily in that world if I did. Um, yep. and, Same. You know, and so uh, from... <laughs> go ahead. No, I was going to say that's, that's, that's the one drug I never did for that same reason. I, I'd studied enough of it in, in university to realize the biological addictiveness of it. And I'm like, if I do that, I'm probably not coming back. So. Yeah. Same here. And I remember, so my sophomore year of college, I had uh, this lady who my neuroscience teacher and she, her prior job is to study the effects of drugs on the brain. And so I remember going to her office hours because no one else was going to them. So I was like, Hey, I'm going to pick your brain on every single drug that you've ever studied. And you know, she's basically going through all of them. And remember after that conversation, like I should never do Molly and I should never do cocaine. Those are kind of the two that I was like, nope, not, not going down that rabbit hole. Cause it was the same thing. Like you said, it was, you know, especially in college for me, when I was drinking, it wasn't like I was just drinking. I was going to get obliterated. It was like how, and I had it down to a science of like, I can take a quarter of a shot or a half a shot and not be blacked out, but be as drunk as possible. And I had this line, I was like, you know, Oh, tonight, if I do like 14 and a half shots, I'll be I'll be okay. I won't black out. I'm just like, I remember one day sitting there on a, like a Sunday hungover as hell and went, realized I went through like a whole handle of vodka in a weekend. And I was like, this is a problem. And that was, I remember that moment, just like being, feeling like absolute shit and seeing this empty bottom. Like I drink that whole thing myself. There's something wrong with this picture that I can even physically do that without going to the hospital. So that was a really big wake up call for me that, you know, made me recognize like, Hey, there's definitely an addictive side of my personality. And that's something like I was saying, you know, earlier on the podcast here is like, I have a hard time turning my brain off because I'm addicted to some degree to growing my business. I'm addicted to personal development, addicted to improve my, my life, that it's a double-edged sword. And that, you know, the, it's really, you know, business to me is a personal development program is, you know, figuring this whole thing out as I go and, and recognizing these, these dark sides of myself, like, Hey, I got to be careful because yeah, I can do all these things, but I can also shoot myself in the foot every step of the way if, if I'm not careful. So I think it's a really big lesson in self-awareness to hear, you know, you share your story in that regard. And, you know, from my own personal experience, like, man, it's, it's a good, it's, I love the, the entrepreneurial life, but there's, there's some challenges that we got to, we got to face those shadows as they come up or else they're going to, they're going to consume us. Yeah. You nailed it. You know, that, and for me, business is a spiritual path. You know, you said it's a growth, personal growth path. 
for me, it's a spiritual path. And I give you some other examples that I, as an entrepreneur, some challenges I faced. And again, I'm, I'm at this point, I'm sober, like six, seven years, which was like five years ago. And just because it is, there's a saying in the program, in the rooms, um, which is that alcohol was but a symptom. Mm. I'm the problem. I'm the problem, meaning that my character defects, my hard wiring, these character defects that I grew built or inherited genetically are the issue. And in business and also in our personal relationships, which is also I think, one of the greatest values that our, our partners bring us, there's a, there's a point where you will face your character defects. A lot of people choose not to face them, but they come up and they're damaging and sometimes they destroy relationships. Sometimes they hurt people. And as a leader, I had to look at those things. You know, I used to be, um, you know, I'm, I'm hardwired to be do extremely dominant. And, and that's also part of the dopamine system. And as it's a great trait as an entrepreneur, but if I, if I'm not loving and caring with that, I can easily hurt people. Right. And I did that, you know, a few times and I learned from that. And it's something I never want to do again. So, I mean, we hear these horror stories with Steve jobs and Bill Gates. And again, it's, it's, it's things that maybe they didn't work on or weren't realizing what was going on, or they worked on it later. Um, but when you start looking at business, spiritual path and you behave that way, it's not acceptable, like to myself, you know, for myself to behave that way. So fortunately, I haven't done that in many years. And it's just one of the many examples I could get into as far as growing as a human or growing spiritually. For sure. Well, growing as a human and growing spiritually, what, what would you say for, for Matt Gallant, the human? What's the, uh, the main focus that you're, any specific goals you're working on? You know, kind of, I know I asked you last time, the five-year plan for bioptimizers, but what's like the the future look like the five, 10, 15, whatever time frame you and dive into for Matt Gallant. Yeah. So, you know, I've been blessed that, um, you know, because of the success of the business and, and doing some, some good investments um, in my life that I don't need to work. And when you get to that point and, and what was cool is even prior to getting to that point, I used to do this meditation, which I, I like to recommend people to do, and I'll, I'll kind of give it to you in 10 seconds, but imagine that you've got a hundred billion dollars in your bank account. You bought all the toys, you've traveled the world, you've done it all and you're tired of it. You know, if you, I don't know if you've watched Dan Bolzerian recently on interviews, he's just released his book and I found it really fascinating because he's there. Like he has done it all. Okay. So, but you know what? You can do that thought experiment in your mind. Like you, you need to, again, it, you need to get into the right meditative space, but play the tape forward. Like just keep going and just live everything in your mind until you're tired of it. And then you wake up and again, you're bored out of your gourd. There's nothing else that'll give you dopamine. You, you've, you've ridden the hedonic treadmill to the top and all that's left is a cliff. What do you want to do? Like, that's the question. And I think the answer to that reveals your purpose. So I'm there. Um, I haven't done all the crazy things Dan has, thank God. But, but I'm there in the sense that I can, I can, again, not work. So... And you could put, again, a hundred billion dollars in my bank. I'm doing the same thing. I'm just doing more of it. I'm doing, I'm hiring more people. I'm building more things. Um, my goal is to build superhumans. So superhumans cognitively, which is why we do Utopia, superhumans biologically. I, I think that our company can single-handedly add a decade or two to, to lifespan and health span. We're, we're going all in. Like I'm, I'm ready to do this for a hundred years. So we're just building company after company with the cohesive vision of, I can take people from sick to superhuman and that's it, man. Like the, I, a few years ago. And again, this is where I was stuck by the way, six to 8 million. I had six companies. So I would do 1 million, 2 million, you know, I think I had one that did three. 
And it was great, you know, and again, I had the great, li- I, it was the ultimate lifestyle. I was working 20 hours a week, eight weeks of vacation and, you know, making a top 1% income and you know, business were doing six to eight. And then I did neurofeedback. And after that neurofeedback, I, I just got reconnected with my purpose, which I used to experience as a teenager, which was to really build, I've got like empire level entrepreneurial drive. Like I'm just wired that way. And I've always been passionate about helping people with health. So th- that's what I'm here to do. That's, that's my purpose. And that's what I'm doing. And it's what I'm ready to do for a hundred years. And it's, it's, it's so fulfilling. It's so awesome. I've never had more fun. I've never felt more blessed. And it's just, it's just humbling. You know, it's humbling. It's, almost overwhelming at times and it's just a blast so that's that's where i'm at and that's where i'm going i love it man well thank you for sharing that and i'm happy for you because it's really cool to see you know all that all that coming to fruition for you and here and obviously you know i love that you shared the struggles of it too because i think that's the, the human side because people can look at someone like dan belzier and make all oh, this dude has done everything he's got the perfect life but it's like he's got his own challenges and i'm sure there were times in his life that he's been in dark places and and even it's almost like a weird it's a weird place he's in, like you said, because he can do and has done so many things. I remember watching an interview of him. This was a, probably a year or two ago. And it's like, so why did you jump out of a plane with a parachute and then go paragliding on the ocean with like, yeah, yeah like all these like layers? She's like, well, I already jumped out of the airplane. I've already gone paragliding. It's like, I had to just combine them all together because like, I don't really know what else to do with myself. I just got to keep putting extreme on top of extreme. And yeah. it's really just interesting to just hear from different people in different stages of life that, I think there's this delusion that at some point we make it and everything is just perfect. But that's, you know, every successful person I've talked to, that's not the case. You're always going to have challenges overcome. And that's, you know, that's kind of life itself is overcoming obstacles and, and doing things and doing more things that, that you love. But at the end of the day, to get to those places, there's going to be those obstacles along the way. And, uh, you know, I think that for you, you know, just my interpretation of what you're saying is that, for you now, money is not the driver. It's, it's, yeah. the, it's the mission. And that's the place yeah. I think that, you know, that's the place I'm going for, you know, money is so I'm still at the, the financial freedom state just yet. But, you know, I think that the mission is, is the main driver. I think when we come from that place, everything seems to open up. Absolutely. And, and you know, again, from a financial level, here, here's my advice in two minutes. One is first level is get out of debt. Right. And there is some smart debt, but you know, credit cards and just, just stupid debt and high interest debt. You want to get rid of that as fast as possible to get it like a six month emergency savings or again, like six months worth of living expenses, which will give you peace of mind. That's a huge cognitively. That's big. Your stress will drop. Third, if you can get to, you know, about 7,500 a month, you know, depending where you live and, you know, we can get into a very key point here, but if you get to about 5k to 7,500 a month in, in personal revenue, you can live most places and live a good life, right? Next, you want you, and this is the key thing. And by the way, I know a lot of people that have made a lot of money that don't do what I'm about to say. This is the critical thing. And it's the gap. You must have gap between your income and your expenses. I know people that make or have made, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions net a year and had nothing left, no gap. And you have no gap, you have nothing left to invest. So, you know, I'm not going to say, and and listen, like there's people that are way more disciplined than I am. Like I know people that are extremely disciplined and frugal and that's a superpower. I was never that guy. I would say I saved maybe like 20% of what I made. I mean, if you can say 50% plus, you're really at the elite level, in my opinion. But, you know, I I always enjoyed traveling and living life and eating good food. So, you know, 20% was my goal. But that 20% allowed me to invest in, you know, crypto and a lot of things that have paid off. So, and then the key goal is to get to a place, this is the ultimate, this is financial independence, where the returns from your investments cover your lifestyle. But that doesn't need to be eight figures. You know, like if you got 
four or five million, which might sound like a lot, but again, if you invest properly and save and it compounds and you know you, you have a good business, you can get there um, re relatively quickly sometimes. And sometimes it's maybe 10, 20 years and you're making seven, 8% off of that. That's 300, 350 a year. Um, and again, like there's places in the world or places in the States you can move to that are a lot cheaper. Are you going to be balling in Manhattan with 350? No, you'll have a good life, but you know, are you balling in Idaho? Yeah. Like in Idaho, you can do it for a hundred K. So I just think being just to summarize, um, it, it comes down to some level of discipline. And again, a lot of people that are entrepreneurial don't have that. You'd be surprised. Like they're good at making money, but they get caught up with the Joneses and showing off or being big time on Instagram and all this stuff. I don't care. I can buy a fleet of Lambos. I have a, a 11 year old, year old Audi A6. It works. I barely drive. Like I said, I don't care. I, I'd rather use Ubers. Like that's not the stuff that I want to invest in. Like I don't, I've got a nice place and home and, and that's, a, that was a good investment, but you know, those are things that I don't think are fulfilling. So as far as materialistic things, I think biohacking equipment is great. Uh, anything that makes you a better human is great. Experiences are great. Great food is, is awesome. Supplements, um, coaching, guidance. Like th those are the things that excites me to invest in. And, you know, the, the rest of it, the materialistic stuff, that's just like the show off stuff, uh, right. I think is just a, a mistake. So anyways. I'm with about. you. No, yeah, I appreciate you outlining that. And, you know, I kind of want to dive in as we wrap up here into Newtopia, because that's something that was not quite around when uh, we had the last episode about a year ago. So I'd love to just have you give the outline about that, you know, what it's about, who it's for, and, you know, how people can get a, a hold of it. Yeah. So back to kind of the initial question, which is, you know, how do you do all these things? Our brains operate off neurochemicals and hormones. Those are the things that allow us to feel certain ways, activate certain functions in the brain. And most people are deficient in one, two, three, four, or more of those. And when they are, they're compromised. They're not their best version of themselves. We already talked about dopamine. Dopamine is for success, the foundational one. And after that, it's acetylcholine, which is the molecule of focus. So if you're acetylcholine deficient, you will not be able to maintain focus. Like it doesn't matter if you want to, you'll struggle. So these are some of the things we can optimize. Then we get into serotonin, which is very stabilizing. It's a, it's a great mood stabilizer. And it's a very important molecule. And I, like I'm genetically on the serotonin deficient side. So when I increase my serotonin and I optimize that, I'm just a better version of myself. My EQ goes up. My ability to connect with people goes up. I'm more extroverted. So that's an example for me personally of something that I want to optimize. Next is adrenaline and noradrenaline. And that's what coffee does. Like coffee... You know, when you when you increase your noradrenaline, you you get activated, right? It's a great activator. So, like at the gym, again, I can use music to do that. And the right level of stimulation of stim will get you to the optimal zone. But with all of these things, more is not better. There's an optimal level for every single person. For some people, if they're a fast caffeine metabolizer, they can drink three cups of coffee. They feel great. They feel optimal. Other people would feel frazzled, burnt out, and it would be too much. So that's where what we do at Utopia is we customize and personalize every single order based on your intake form. And then we continue optimizing every single month based on the feedback you give us in the app and the feedback that you give us at the end of the month. So you say... That was not enough stimulation. I want more. I like. I liked it, but I want more. Or that was too much. We can pull it back. So what we've done is we have nine base stacks. Every stack has a purpose. 
And what they do is they activate different states or they optimize different states from, again, hyper-focused to being more upbeat to cleaning your brain at night, to cleaning your brain in the morning that's meant to reboot AM and PM. All of these different things do different things. We have Xamner juice, which is kind of a, a GABA enhancer, it's like serotonin dopamine enhancer. And what we teach people how to do is how to stack them, when to use them, the timing of things. So what I do when I wake up in the morning is I look at my calendar, like I did that this morning. I look at my calendar. I say, okay, I got Rob, I've got a podcast. I'm going to take the right stack about an hour before the podcast so that I'm more extroverted, I'm more talkative, I feel more connected, and my verbal fluency is optimized. So that's what I did. It's what I took. And again, depending what my activities are, I, I change stacks and I use stacks. So this is neurochemistry optimization at a level that's never been offered to the general public. This kind of optimization typically costs 100 to 150K a year to hire a neurochemist that is extremely knowledgeable and will build your own personalized stacks. Now, what we do is a fraction of a fraction of that. And again, we have every level from kind of, I want to use it occasionally to, I want world domination. That's the, that's the name of our top level package is world domination, which of course is benevolent, positive world domination. We're here to build good things, but you know, it, that's, that's where I'm at. So I'm, I use the nootropics almost every day. Um, I, I, it's a very, it changes depending what I have to do, but it's been a game changer before this, before I met Mr. Nudes, I would use nootropics like two or three times a month. And it was cool. You know, it would kind of give me hyper-focus or mental endurance, which are sometimes some things we needed, but it's nothing like this. The, the variance and the nuances and the abilities to shift states and get exactly what I want is, it's amazing. It's a dream come true for me as a user. And that's why we decided to offer this. I think for anyone that's an entrepreneur and wants to do any of the things we talked about and you're making money with your mind, it's a no brainer, no pun intended. So I think the link is newtopia.com forward slash VIP, I believe is the, is the link. Yep. And there's a discount code uh, as well. So yeah, check it out. Yeah. So I'll put that link in there in utopia.com slash VIP. And then same thing with bioptimizers, uh, the code whole health, W H O L E health, all one word will save you a little percentage on there as well. So again, if you didn't catch that, um, I'll put that in the description box for, for you. I got one, and I got one more gift for everyone. Um, I have a personal blog and again, full, full disclosure, I've not been active on it for about five years, probably start writing again, but one of those things where, it didn't make sense to spend three hours a week working on a blog post, but it's mattgallant.tv. And if you go to mattgallant.tv forward slash the number three, and then X, I have an 82 page book. It's free. I just give it away. It's called triple your productivity. And that book is a good summary and a deep dive into a lot of the things we touched upon and everything from how to schedule your time, how to, figure out the high impact stuff to recovery. Um, it, it's a great book. A lot of people have had a lot of value from it. I just give it away. It's just something that I wrote and put on the site. So check it out. Matt Gallant TV forward slash number three, uh, small X and Rob will put the link for that as well. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, Matt, thank you so much for your time, my friend. It's always, always a pleasure to chat with you. And it's cool to have uh, two different topics. We now talked, touched on the first one being, all health related, this one being a little bit more business related. So I appreciate your time, man. I really do. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next conversation. I know that we, uh, on the last podcast, I was listening to it and we we're saying we're going to have our centenarian podcast once on my hundredth birthday. So uh, it's, it's, it's cool to think about, you know, that's a reality, you know, with a lot of taking care of our health and actually taking care of ourselves. Like I'm sure yeah. a lot of people listen, I think that's a joke, but Hey, I'm really going to be at least a hundred. That's, that's my target goal. I know you, you feel the same way. So it's, I'm, cool. I'm, I'm, I feel like 150. Again, <laughs> I always want to be humble. I don't, I'm not going to say it's a lock, but I'm extremely confident. I, I, I think, yeah, I think people are going to be breaking 
longevity records uh, constantly starting in probably 15, 20 years. Like, you know, I have a client, a friend, a good friend of mine. Uh, he's been aging in reverse, about to hit 80. And I've just been helping the last like six years because I love him. He's a great man. And he's literally been aging in reverse, like in every measurable way. Visually, he's down 45 pounds. It's probably the leanest he's been in decades. Uh, hormonally, biologically, like it doesn't matter how you look at him. He He's getting younger. So, you know, and that's going to become the norm. And, you know, he's doing all the biohacking stuff and taking all the supplements and it's working, you know. So, yeah, for those of us that are younger, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, they're doing the right things now. Um, you know, I think like longevity is like a ship. And if you're off course by one degree, it's the difference between going to Africa versus France or Paris, right? So as long as we keep adjusting, and that's where I think using data and tests and looking at your good biomarkers and creating feedback loops and making sure that if you are off course, that you readjust. Like, you know, most people's blood work is off for a long time before disease shows up. So if you can make those course corrections a lot faster and earlier, you can avoid, you know, hitting icebergs. So I think that's my, my perspective. And I think we're going to see some, we'll, we'll be rocking the 100, man. And I think we'll be rocking the 150. So that's my I opinion. love it. Let's do it, man. Well, Matt, I appreciate you. Appreciate you all listening in here today. So have a great day and we'll see you on the flip side. Thank you. I really want to thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast with Matt Galante. I mean, if you've gone this far, you know that Matt is a powerhouse. If you haven't already checked out our first episode where we really dive into bio-optimizers and all the different health products that myself and Matt work with, I will put that link in the show notes here as well because those are two similar but very different conversations in terms of topics. You know, in the last one, we're talking really a lot about the science of these health products, talking about how we can optimize our health. We're obviously in this episode, we're talking more about business, entrepreneurship, and everything that comes along with that. So if you want to try by Optimizers products or Newtopia products, you can use the discount code Whole Health, and that will save you about 10% on every single order that you place. And I'll put that link in the description box here as well. For me personally, as it relates to by Optimizers, the mass Symes, the P3OM are the two that I use just about every single day. Um, not to mention the magnesium, I use that every single day as well. Uh, Gluten Guardian is a really good one on any cheat day we're having. I like to make homemade pizza with some locally made dough, um, homegrown tomatoes, homegrown basil, some raw cheese. And, you know, sometimes we need a little support. Sometimes we have a cheat day and the Gluten Guardian is great for just that. And then the Leaky Gut Guardian, as you know, I'm a big fan of raw milk. If you put a little of the Leaky Gut Guardian chocolate in with some raw milk, (sighs) that's what I call a kick-ass healthy chocolate milk. So you can check all those out. I'll put the links in the description box here um, to buy optimizers. You can try the Newtopia products um, to get your brain on function, functioning at the top level. Um, I also use Cognium Biotics by buy optimizers for that same reason. So and I could go on and on all, about all these fabulous products that I use. Use the discount code Whole Health to save 10%. And really want to encourage you to share this podcast with a friend, family member, whoever you think that could benefit from this. If you know an entrepreneur in your life, you know, a small business owner, I think this can really help give them a little bit of a solid perspective of how they can best optimize their time, optimize their life, and just have a lot more fun in the process of growing their business. So thank you again for listening. Have an epic day. See you in the next episode.